Well, this morning, we are beginning a new series titled Body Talk. Now, can we all just acknowledge that we're at least a little bit uncomfortable with our bodies? Have you ever had that alarming dream where you show up to school or work or some other public place naked? Yeah, anybody? Yeah. You're thinking to yourself, why didn't I put on clothes? <laughs> totally would have been a great idea to put on clothes. Definitely should have put on clothes. Remember trying to manage your body in middle school? Yeah, those middle school locker rooms, those were awkward. My middle school locker room had showers. Nobody was getting anywhere near taking a shower in middle school. I mean, everybody's body's changing at different times. Some eighth graders were shaving. Some eighth graders looked like they were still in elementary school. It was uncomfortable for everybody. Our culture doesn't quite know what to do with the body. We love it. We hate it. We clothe it. We expose it. It's sacred. It's common. It's everything. It's nothing. We accept it. We do everything we can to try to change it. We protect it. We give it away to anybody. It's the essence of who we are, or it's just biological tissue. The reality is we, that there are a whole host of subjects related to the body we just don't know how to think about. Sex, gender, personal identity, the afterlife, abortion. We don't know how to think about the body. In fact, we've only got one ethic remaining when it comes to the body, and it's this. It's my body, and I can do whatever I want with it. Now, I think it's important for us to tackle these topics. Can we just talk about them? Can we do that here? That's our goal in this series, is we want to talk about these subjects connected to the body. Now, just like when you were in middle school, at times it may feel a little bit uncomfortable. You may feel a little bit awkward. You may see, hear some things that you don't agree with right away. Well, I want to encourage you to lean into the conversation anyway. And here's my goal for us in this series. My goal is that we would recover a biblical perspective on the body. Now, our key passage for this whole series is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And so we're going to read beginning in verse 12. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Let's pause a moment and pray. Lord God, we love you. Father, I thank you that this whole world belongs to you. And Lord, you've got purpose for every part of who we are. This morning, I pray, Father, that by your Holy Spirit, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe all that you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this morning, I want to lay an important foundation for the entire series. And what we're going to discover is that each of these subjects that we talk about really comes down to questions of worldview, questions of worldview. One author, Nancy Percy, writes this, in every decision we make, we are not just deciding what we want to do. We are expressing our view of the purpose of human life. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, the Christian and the materialist hold different beliefs about the universe. They can't both be right. The one who is wrong will act in a way which simply doesn't fit the real universe. Do you know actions are not isolated events? 
They are expressions of our deeper beliefs and commitments. And some beliefs and commitments don't fit into reality as well as others do. So what's shaping our worldview? Well, a million things. In fact, experts in digital advertising tell us that we view literally thousands and thousands of brands and ads every single day. And most of these ads are trying to tell us something about the kind of world we should want to live in, the kind of bodies we should want to have, the kind of lives we should want to have. So consider, for example, this advertisement for Cadillac. Now, Notice here, we've got, of course, a picture of this cool car. Now, I don't know if this car belongs to that couple, but if it does, pretty sure they're going to get a ticket. <laughs> Last time I checked, you can't park right in the middle of the road. <laughs> right? They obviously live in some swanky, cool, urban location, which is way cooler than living in the suburbs, of course. Notice, it's a couple. They're together. It's way better, the ad is telling us, to be in a relationship with somebody than to be by yourself. Now, notice they're dressed kind of cool. They're kind of thin. And notice the gal, she's got a little pep in her step, right? <laughs> she looks a little excited, like she's got it going on in her life. She's got places to be, and she's excited, and that's the kind of life that you should have as well. Or check out this ad from Old Navy. A bunch of ladies here. Now, notice what the ad says. A perfect fit for everybody. Now, I don't know about you, but I think maybe not everybody is represented there. <laughs> it looks like kind of a lot of skinny ladies, right? <laughs> and notice, they are psyched. They are really happy. And in fact, this is the underlying idea behind every ad, that you should be happy all the time. And if you're not happy all the time, there's something wrong with you. Right? This has become the thing that we live for. Happiness is our new purpose for existence. It's not knowing God or glorifying God. It's not serving our neighbor. It's not becoming people of real substance and character. It's feeling happy all the time. And so we try to shield ourselves and our children from any experience of emotional or physical pain. We even define good and evil according to what makes me happy. We give people certificates of participation just for showing up. We try to control language so that nobody gets triggered by what we say. We feel like we need Netflix and YouTube to entertain us all the time because our new reason for existence is just being happy. Now, trying to live with this kind of worldview has consequences. We're actually more anxious and depressed than ever before. Our souls are thin, and we're missing God. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthians. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But watch this. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. The Apostle Paul realized that this pain and difficulty I go through in my life can actually be used for my good. Now, why did he see this? How did he come to this understanding? It's because he had a worldview that was based upon the Old Testament scriptures and the teaching of Jesus. Now, what about us? Should we really have a worldview on topics like justice and meaning and purpose and sex and the body that's built upon the Bible? Should we really look to these scriptures to inform our worldview? Reality is that we already live in a world that's shaped by the biblical scriptures. In fact, there are things that we take to be obvious that people living in other times and other places and other cultures did not consider to be obvious. Take science, for example. Why in the world is science even possible? What does a person have to believe for science to even be conceivable? Well, it's going to be helpful to believe that the universe is actually real, which is a big difference from what many of the Eastern religions teach, that the universe is really just an illusion. It's going to be helpful to believe that the universe is valuable and good and worth studying, which was the opposite of what almost all Greek philosophy taught. 
It's going to be helpful to believe that the universe is not divine and that the various elements in the universe are not manifestations of competing deities, which is what virtually everybody in the ancient Near East believed. It's going to be helpful to believe that the universe is orderly and rational because it's governed by an orderly and rational and omnipotent being. Now, where would somebody get beliefs like that? Well, one Nobel Prize winning scientist, a biochemist, said this. As I try to discern the origin of that conviction, I seem to find it in a basic notion discovered 2,000 or 3,000 years ago and enunciated first in the Western world by the ancient Hebrews, namely that the universe is governed by a single God and is not the product of the whims of many gods, each governing his own province according to his own laws. This monotheistic view seems to be the historical foundation for modern science. Do you realize that in most worldviews, science never comes about? It just never is going to come into being. You have to believe the right things first. What about this sense of justice that we have, that there should be justice in the world? Ancient peoples didn't believe that. What about the way that we value women or the way that we value children? Do you know in the Greco-Roman world, children were non-persons. In the Roman world, a father legally could kill his children for any reason. See, most of what we consider to be obvious was not obvious to other people. It only emerged because our world has been deeply impacted by the writings of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Now, maybe you will grant this. Maybe you'll say, sure, our world was shaped by those things, but still the question remains, should we allow the scriptures to shape our worldview in the present? Well, here's the big claim. The scriptures are not merely human documents. They are certainly that, but they are more than that. They are divine revelation. The scriptures are divine revelation. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it to Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Can we really believe a huge claim like that? In 2019, in this corner of the world, can we really believe that the scriptures are divine revelation? Well, let me share with you a couple of thoughts. The first has to do with the ancient Israelites. Now, Israel was a tiny people group living on a tiny strip of land on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And their entire existence was lived in the shadow of the great superpowers like Egypt and Assyria and Babylon. And somehow, even after being enslaved in Egypt for generations and then being exiled to Babylon, somehow they still came out with views concerning deity and human dignity and ultimate reality that were way different than all the more powerful people groups living around them. How in the world did that happen? Let me give you one of the, an explanation by a great Old Testament scholar, John Walton, describing some of these differences between their worldview and the worldview of the surrounding peoples. Consider the issue of the ultimacy of deity. Here's what Israel believed. The God of Israel is the ultimate power in the universe. He answers to no one, and there are no limitations on his jurisdiction. Now, all the nations around Israel believe this. The gods have competing agendas and limited jurisdiction. Even as a corporate body, they do not exercise ultimate sovereignty. What about the disposition of deity? How do the gods feel about us? Well, Israel believed that the God of Israel is consistent in character and has bound himself by his attributes. The pagan nations believed deity is not bound by any code of conduct. The gods are inconsistent, unpredictable, and accountable only marginally to the divine assembly. What about the requirements of deity? What does God or the gods want from us? The God of Israel has made known in detail what he requires through the giving of the law. But the nations around Israel believe that what is required of human beings has not been revealed. And this made life really complicated. It can only be inferred from one's fortunes. I try to figure out what the gods want from me based on how my life is going. Or what about the issue of the creation of the cosmos? Well, Israel believed that the God of Israel undertook and sovereignly executed a cohesive plan of creation. The surrounding nations taught that the creation of the cosmos came about through the procreation of the gods with no directing influence and was organized and established through conflict between the gods. 
What about human dignity? Well, what did Israel believe? Human dignity is derived from being created in the image of God and being placed over creation. God creates for people and with people in mind. But the surrounding nations believe that since humans were a bother and an afterthought and were created to be slaves, dignity is derived from the belief that they provide the needs of the gods. Now, here's the obvious question. How did this seemingly insignificant people group on the eastern end of the Mediterranean land on views that differed so strikingly than all the peoples around them? I mean, this begs for an explanation. And if we let the Israelites themselves provide the answer, they would say it's divine revelation. It was divine revelation. Psalm 147 says, He has revealed his word to Jacob, his laws and decrees to Israel. He has done this for no other nation. They do not know his laws. The consistent claim throughout the Old Testament of the beliefs of the Israelites being different, different from the nations around them was because God is a God who speaks, and God had made himself known to them, and this was preserved and written down in the scriptures that made up their Old Testament. Now, what about Jesus? Jesus is the central figure in the Christian faith. As I have often pointed out, we can actually make an incredibly strong historical case for Jesus' resurrection from the dead just by analyzing the New Testament documents as historical documents, not even treating them as holy scripture. And what we find is that if Jesus has been raised from the dead, then it is completely reasonable to adopt his perspective on the scriptures as our perspective on the scriptures. So what was Jesus' perspective? How did he treat the scriptures? Well, he saw them as the divine word of God. In fact, Jesus leaned on the scriptures for every part of his life and ministry. And then his teaching, he empowered 12 apostles to broadcast his teaching to all the nations in the earth. In fact, he said this about his own teaching. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. I want to encourage you to adopt the same view on the scriptures that ancient Israel had, that Jesus had, that the apostle Paul had, and that the church throughout the centuries has, has taken. Namely, that the scriptures are the divine word of God. They're a revelation from him. And if that is true, then we should look to the scriptures when we're thinking about the most important things in life, justice and meaning and purpose in our bodies and sexuality and identity. We should look to the scriptures to form our worldview on these subjects. So what do the scriptures say? What do the scriptures say about this physical world that we live in and these physical bodies that we inhabit? Well, number one, the physical world matters. The physical world matters. You know, throughout history, both within the church and outside of the church, there's been this tendency to separate spirituality from the physical world. In fact, we see this very early on. The Greek philosophy, as we mentioned already, had a very low view of the body. And so many of the Gentiles, when they came into the church, had trouble getting rid of that understanding. This is why we see the Apostle Paul in places like 1 Corinthians pushing back on this perspective that the body doesn't really matter. By the second century, we see this philosophy of Gnosticism working its way into certain corners of the church. Now, in Gnosticism, they believed that the world of space, time, and matter was inferior because it was created by some inferior and perhaps even evil being. And so under Gnosticism, you needed to discover the secret knowledge that would allow you to escape ultimately from your physical body and physical reality and live in a pure spiritual bliss. Later on in the church, the church began to associate holiness with extreme asceticism. It was almost like the body and physical creation were the enemy. People were almost afraid of any kind of physical pleasure. And so they renounced food and drink and regular clothing and shelter and gave themselves extreme discipline in their bodies. Even in the contemporary church, we find people oftentimes still viewing salvation as an escape from the body, an escape from physical reality. But friends, this is not the picture in the scriptures. In fact, here's how John describes the future. 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Now, obviously, when we read in the book of Revelation, it's full of symbolism. But one thing is abundantly clear. The future is not immaterial. The physical world matters. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he wanted to make it abundantly clear that he was raised bodily, physically from the dead, that he was given a new physical body. So here's what we read in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus himself stood among his disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Now notice what Jesus says. He says, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Why was he doing this? Well, obviously, the disciples knew that just a few days prior, Jesus had been crucified. And so huge nails had been driven through his wrists and his ankles. And he's showing him his wrists and his ankles to demonstrate that it is really him. These marks show some continuity in Jesus' existence. Now, this is really important because it shows us that even though the body certainly will be transformed, there is a continuity continuity between our present physical body and our future physical body. And this means that what you do in your physical body in the present will be part of your story in the future. The physical body, it's not irrelevant. It's not insignificant. In fact, Paul tells the Romans that God is not going to discard our bodies. He's going to redeem our bodies. The physical world matters. Number two, the physical world speaks. The physical world speaks. We read this in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. God reveals varying aspects of his nature and his purpose through the physical creation. In fact, the Apostle Paul picks up on this theme at the beginning of his letter to the Romans. And Paul writes this, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. In fact, Paul goes on to argue in Romans that because this revelation in nature should inform both our worship and our sexual practices, that we are without excuse. The Gentiles fell into sin because they neglected and covered up what God was speaking to them through the physical universe. The physical creation reveals purpose, and God has designed us to discover it. Did you know that even young children very quickly begin recognizing purpose in the physical universe? And actually, at a very young age, they begin inferring the existence of a non-human designer of all things. Let me give you a summary of the research. From infancy, children understand that agents can create order, but non-agents cannot. By the preschool years, at least, children see things in the natural world as designed and purposeful. By four years old, children appear to understand that the designer of the world is not human. The physical world speaks. You know, it's interesting, Jesus and the Apostle Paul both point to the physical world to speak to God's disposition toward us as human beings. Listen to what Jesus says. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The physical creation tells us that God cares for all people. 
Paul makes a similar argument in the book of Acts. Friends, we are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Have you ever eaten a great meal with friends and just gotten really happy? Ever experienced that? When my wife Jennifer and I were on our honeymoon, there was somebody who was fishing in a nearby river, caught fresh trout, brought it to the place we were staying, and smoked the trout right there, and we had the freshest trout we have ever eaten in our lives. It was unbelievable. I think there was like a little tear coming down from my eye as I ate. We still talk about it today, over 20 years later. I can remember being at a friend's bachelor party, and I don't know what it was. I don't even remember who the cook was, but we had the most incredible grilled hamburgers I have ever had. I remember just chewing. I was speechless. I kept looking over at my friends, and we almost in disbelief. Like, is it really this good right now? Do you recognize that God has made this physical world and designed our physical bodies so we can enjoy the good things that he gives, has given to us? See, the physical world speaks. It tells us about God's disposition toward human beings, that he cares for us, that he loves us. And so when we think about identity and sex, and so many other aspects having to do with the body, we need to understand that we need to look at the body as well, that God will reveal things about his purpose through his physical creation. Number three, the physical world is intertwined with the spiritual world. The physical world is intertwined with the spiritual world. As we saw, the Corinthians had this, um, this tendency to devalue the body and to think that it was basically irrelevant for true spirituality. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is pushing back on that viewpoint. In fact, listen to all the things that Paul says about the connection between the physical world and our physical bodies and our spiritual lives. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You know, our spiritual life affects our bodies. And what we do in our bodies affects our spiritual lives. Do you know one of the best things you can do for the health of your physical body? It's seek and receive forgiveness. Seek and receive and extend to others forgiveness. Research has borne this out. When you forgive other people, when you receive forgiveness for the wrongdoing that you've done, your body responds in a positive way. Now, David wrote about this centuries ago. Listen to what he writes. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Now, did you see this shift? He's talking about wasting away, being sapped of energy, groaning all day long. And then he seeks forgiveness from God. And what happens? Oh, he's re-energized. He's singing. He's rejoicing. This can be our experience because the spiritual world is intertwined with the physical world. And when things are not right spiritually, it will affect you in your body. You know, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians that the way they were handling the Lord's Supper, this spiritual moment before God, was actually affecting their bodies because they weren't approaching it in a worthy manner. Paul says that some of them were getting sick and some of them were even dying. The spiritual world is intertwined with the physical world. What we do in our bodies affects our spiritual lives. 
Do you know your sex life affects your prayer life? We can't separate these things. When we don't live in the way that God desires us to live, it affects our bodies. What we do in our bodies affects our spiritual life. What we do spiritually affects our bodies. This is why Paul told the Corinthians, honor God with your bodies. Paul told the Romans, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Friends, the physical world matters. The physical world matters. The physical world speaks to us. It shows us who God is. It shows us his purpose for life. We cannot separate the physical world from the spiritual world. They are intertwined. Therefore, let's honor God with our bodies. Let's pray. Lord God, we worship you in this place. Lord, we recognize today that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who dwell in it. Lord, that everything has been created by you and for you. Father, you know the struggle that we have in our bodies sometimes. Some of us deal with self-hatred. Some of us have done things in our bodies that we're ashamed of. Some of us aren't quite sure what to think. God, today we want to recognize that our bodies belong to you, that you've given them these bodies to us to serve your purposes. God, sometimes we groan in these bodies, but I thank you, Lord, that ultimately you will redeem our bodies. Just while we're in this moment of prayer, you may be here today and you may be thinking, you know, I need God. I need God. All of us get off track sometimes. We recognize, I want what God has for my life. I want his purpose. I want his way. I want his plan. If that's you today, I want to encourage you to take a very simple but concrete step, to take a moment to grab one of the cards and the seat backs in front of you and to fill it out. And on the back of that card, indicate today, I am making a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. When we take these simple steps, God meets us. He begins to make all things new. He begins to bring reconciliation. He extends forgiveness to us as we turn from ways that we've lived in the past. Father, thank you. Lord, that when we turn our hearts to you, in our own lives, the new creation can already begin. That your spirit comes and dwells on the inside of us. And even though our bodies groan, Lord, you bring fresh life. You renew us. You re-energize us. You strengthen us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to think about our bodies or that we'd have a perspective on this physical world and on our own physical bodies that you want us to have. Lord, have our hearts. Have all that we are. Lord, we choose today, as your word says, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you. Have your way in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give God praise today, church?